Okay. Uh, plenary session is a keynote spotlight on the table 2023. Uh, thank you for uh, group uh, for coming. And we have many uh, <coughs> distinguished uh, faculties, uh, panelists here. Che Yin Ho, David Cohen again, Dr. Hayashita, Ko Young Park Do Gu, Dr. Nicholas Alan Young here. So, Dr. Group will give us aortic stenosis, uh, lifetime management. Yeah, so thank you very much for having me again. It was a little bumpy road um, to get here. Uh, but there's nothing we can do about typhoons. And um, I'm happy that I landed an hour ago, and I'm glad to see all my friends sitting here. So topic is uh, TAVA lifetime management. Uh, and that is something that you believe is very boring um, as, a, as a topic. But I hope to uh, spice this up a little bit, not only bit with different thoughts, but maybe also with some different slides. So this is the roadmap of my presentation. We expand indication to asymptomatic and moderate aortic stenosis. Then we move on to failed THVs and valve and valve, specifically talking about durability and future interventions. And finally, coronary access PCI and TAVR and future valves here, coronary heart disease and new um, valves. And I would like to give you a little bit of a glimpse to that. Decisions for aortic valve replacement obviously have changed based on different long-term priorities. At the beginning of TAVR, we had the procedural success metrics in the foreground. Basically, we want to make sure that this TAVR procedure is a safe procedure with safety endpoints. Obviously, as we moved along <clears throat> with more data, there was a shift in focus now to management metrics, hemodynamics, patient procedures mismatch, durability, life expectancy, uh, coronary access, and of course, valve and valve situations, along with age differences, risk differences, and anatomy differences. This is an interesting slide. It summarizes, kind of busy, but the most important thing is down here. If we look at the various age groups, below 65, 65 to 80, and over 80 years, TAVA rose significantly percentage-wise. Uh, and inversely, surgery fell. Um, you know, the, the, the older you, you got, the more su uh, surgery fell, as would be expected. So certainly... Uh, now we're shifting into something that we believe uh, is important. Uh, consequently, the lifetime management becomes uh, fundamentally um, important for the, for the aspect of TAVA. Uh, the impact of TAVA in the modern era, three foundational pillars, the heart team, image-guided therapy, and the lifetime journey, I think that is fair to say. And uh, we expand indications to asymptomatic, moderate aortic stenosis. I don't want to talk too much due to the time constraints about asymptomatic aortic stenosis. Um, we leave that aside. But I would just like to remind you of the surgical trials on asymptomatic uh, stenosis, um, the recovery trial, which, is, uh, which showed that watchful waiting um, is, is inferior to early surgical intervention, 7% to 22%. So there is one point to speak for uh, earlier interventions. Now, to moderate aortic stenosis, we can say that current treatment paradigm for moderate AS is to wait for the stenosis to be severe because we intervene, which we call watchful waiting. Uh, if we look at the natural history of untreated moderate aortic stenosis and we look at the national database, we can summarize that moderate aortic stenosis is not a design disease. And we have to maybe think a little bit differently as we go into this patient subset. Watchful waiting for moderate aortic stenosis is ingrained in clinical practice. Issues that we have with watchful waiting for moderate aortic stenosis Rate of stenosis progression is highly variable. Moderate aortic stenosis has been associated with significant cardiovascular events and mortality in observational studies. And waiting for aortic stenosis to progress to severe before intervening may result in irreversible cardiac damage and worse prognosis, even 
after aortic valve replacement. So obviously we aim to early intervene in order to avoid permanent damage in the myocardium. Obviously there are challenges. What is, when is, and what is the best time? When is the best time to intervene? It shouldn't be too early, definitely not too late. So we have to find optimal timing to offer uh, intervention. Here are the challenges in evaluating cardiac function because that's what we try to do in order to delineate and to define when damage occurs in the myocardium. And we have various ways to doing it by echo, uh, by MDCT, and by biomarkers. Uh, so basically, multimodalities are there to evaluate the impact of intervention and enhance prognostic risk ratification. I think that's very important that we use those. And that's not only true for aortic stenosis, but as we move along in aortic regurgitation, we probably have to do the same thing. Earlier TAVA trial and unload trial um, are um, uh, complete, the primary complete, and the study complete, 6, 2024. We will have an answer then. It, it still takes a little while. And here, the moderate aortic stenosis TAVR studies, the PROGRESS trial and the EXPAND-2 trial, the PROGRESS trial using SAPIEN and ULTRA, and the EXPAND trial using um, self-expanding EVOLUTE, basically slightly different setup, but basically aiming at this patient cohort. So now comes the, the, the issue of durability, and durability obviously has been a, a long story that uh, is important to address as pointed out in the beginning. It is a progressive, um, it is a progressive um, uh, issue that begins with hemodynamic deterioration, degeneration eventually ends in failure. This is an ongoing discussion, as we all know, from day one, Taver, particularly with our surgical colleagues, they always said, you know, you don't have any durability data. Now we have them, now the focus has shifted. THVs have collected more rigorous durability data than any surgical valve to date, and we are very aware of it, um, but focus on durability is obviously a very important thing. We know it is multifactorial, it is patient-related and prosthesis-related. An ideal THV should replicate a healthy aortic valve going through 40 million cycles per year with unfaltering function. That is what we are looking for. The problem there was comparing surgery and uh, interventional um, valves, uh, the, the lack of, of uniform definitions. Well, that has changed now, uh, and we see here now the uh, consensus document, which very clearly, VARC 3 uh, uh, document, very clearly separates and defines uh, the various, uh, various failure modes, structural valve deterioration, SVD, non-SVD, thrombosis, endocarditis, and that all together is spiroprosthetic valve dysfunction. Not to uh, move to the more clinical part, which is spiroprosthetic failure. The good news here, looking at these European definitions, the numbers are low for severe SVD, and also for bioprosthetic valve failure on the right side, 1.3 and 3.7, that's actually good news. If we look at the comparison self-expanding and balloon expandable valves, here we have the partner two five-year follow-up data for structural valve deterioration. As you know, um, the, this is Sapien XT versus surgery, randomized data. XT wasn't doing so well as compared to surgery. If we look at the S3 versus surgery in five years, we should be reminded that those data are not randomized, they are propensity matched. And if you look down, and the, the numbers are equal, but if you look down, the rate of BVF at five years um, trended to be higher with the Sapien 3 than surgery. And the all cause bioprosthetic valve failure in terms of 100, 100 patient years was significantly increased at, five, at four and five years after the procedure. The self-expanding data, uh, you know here, the notion eight-year uh, follow-up has been uh, published, discussed, uh, structural valve deterioration, uh, quite good compared to surgery, first-generation core valve superior to surgery, hemodynamics were good, all-cause mortality were the same, and if we move on to the various other 
um, core valve iterations down to Evolute, then basically we have the same uh, results. And on the right side, the meta-analysis of structural valve deterioration in self-expanding valve trended, and comparing this to surgery, trended to those self-expanding valves. Question is, halt, <coughs> does halt impact uh, durability? Um, at this point, uh, we have to say in both Partner 3 and Evolute low risk, HALT did not result in any hemodynamic changes so far. So if we look at planning for future interventions, lifetime management in patients undergoing TAVR, then we can see here, you know, we've separate um, a gentleman uh, above 80 years and then the age group that we're dealing here with, 65 up to uh, 85 years. And I think it is fair to say that above 80 years, then the first choice definitely uh, is TAVA followed by TAVA. I think that's, that's fair to say. Here, when we get younger, it is up to the heart team to decide which is the best. And, you know, if you, do, if, if you choose TAVA, then the second probably is also TAVA. If you choose uh, if you choose surgery, most likely also TAVA because the mortality for TAVA for valve explants is not insignificant. The goal, at any rate, is to minimize open heart procedures and avoid performing them when the patient is older and at higher risk. TAVA will be likely the most frequent second intervention in a lifetime strategy of patients. And TAVA repeatability might be as important as leaflet durability. What do we have if a, veil, if a valve fails? Well, we have TAF and SAF and TAF and TAF. Most important, um, what are the main concerns? PPM, pace procedures mismatch, coronary obstruction, the gradient, and of course, thrombosis and reduced leaflet motion. Does PPM, uh, does PPM impact mortality? Yes, it does. And we can see here, multiple series show higher mortality rates in patients undergoing TAF in smaller surgical valves with residual PPM. So we should try to avoid PPM if ever possible. Uh, then the question of coronary occlusion, sequestration of sinuses, something that's very important that we look into as we do a valve and valve procedure that has been discussed. Um, and we have to <coughs> understand if we do have a problem, then we have uh, various procedures to avoid that. That is Basilica as an example. But you have to understand, we have to remember that um, some procedures are not amenable to Basilica, and we have to try to avoid these um, when we talk about valve and valve situation. Coronary heart disease, obviously, the approach undergoing TAVA in younger patients, once they have it, what is the best strategy, uh, how do we choose, and that is something that cannot be simply answered yes or no, or this way or that way. It depends on patient symptoms on lesion complexity, on comorbidities, and on coronary access post-TAVA. Whatever the access might be, and whatever the choice might be, we have to make sure that both anatomic and device features allow for coronary access. That is a must today uh, as we move um, along with more modern valves. We don't need to speak about commissure alignment. That has been discussed, but this is something that is today state of the art, and we have to make sure that we all do this in our patients. So let's look a few bioprosthetic valves in the future. Uh, it's all about the leaflets and material science, the anterior stura transcatheter valve, and the foldex trier heart valve. Here we can see the anterior stura valve bioprosthetic, uh, sorry bioprosthetic uh, a valve which mimics the, um, uh, let me start the, um, uh, the, 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 the movies. Uh, it's a native-like uh, valve. It mimics the, mo the natural valve has a larger opening area. It is a one piece 3D. Um, and we, or the company hopes uh, that, you know, this is reflected and conveyed into outcomes data. Um, the, la the, the latest uh, data have been published by um, and discussed by Sushil Kodali at uh, EuroPCR. 
Um, robotic manufacturing, with all its advantages and potentially also disadvantages, here at the Foldex valve, Foldex surgical valves are being implanted in India at this point for various reasons, not time to discuss right now, but they are out for Tava valves, uh, both aortic and mitral valves. So that's an interesting aspect as we move along. And last but not least, something that's a little bit closer to us, the modular Tava system, the valve medical ZMAT system, here you can see, um, is the assembled device it's consisting of a valve module and an anchor module. Uh, here you can see again the anchor module, the three-piece bovine, it's not crimped, it's folded. Uh, the nine French or uh, 12 OD, uh, to come nine French OD compared to others. And here you have um, swelling, a foam that addresses PVL when this material gets in contact with blood. And here you can see the ODs of Evolute and Actual Sapien as a comparison. Um, the first cases, actually two cases have been done. Um, the first case I would like to show to you because it's such a new approach that it's, I think, worthwhile to look at. You can see it's a very, very thin, flexible valve that gets around the aortic arch quite nicely uh, without kinking. Uh, the upper frame is deployed, which is the anchor module. Uh, if you look here, um, the anchor module, the, the upper valve, that's the part that's being deployed. In the ascending aorta, uh, the aortic valve is untouched so far. Then the valve module is, um, is assembled here in the, uh, in the ascending aorta. As we move along, and then it's pre-docking, and then it's the docking. You push the valve module down into the valve, and you push both the assembled valve into the aorta uh, with, a, a, with a very nice result. Rand Kornofsky and his team in Israel <coughs> did, the first, uh, did the first case. It was very successful, very short, and it's interesting what the next cases will show. Obviously, the promise and the dream, one valve for life, maybe at some point we will have it. For the time being, we have to live what we get. So finally, what can we learn from the TAVA success to future trends in structural heart disease? Interventional cardiology has been driven by technology innovations and by better understanding the cardiovascular disease. It is the individuals with strong conviction, vision, risk-taking and resilience teaming with technology innovators who have been driving forward new therapies and challenging the community with out-of-the-box ideas. With that, thank you, SJ, for having me again. I'm glad I made it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Great. Uh, next talk is uh, Nicholas. A paradigm shift to the Belbin Bell for first, second, and more bells. Please. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I want to say how thrilled I am, and I keep being uh, on my second day here in South Korea. So thank you again for the very nice and kind invitation. And it's always a pleasure to share the same stage and to follow up on a speech by my good friend and mentor, Professor Grube. So I'm going to talk about uh, a paradigm shift to valve and valves, and uh, this already uh, has been mentioned uh, by, um, by Eberhard because, yes, this also relates to lifetime management. So what, is, what, what do we need to do? Do we need to start with the TAVI first and then proceed with the surgery? Or do we start with surgery and then uh, continue with the TAVI procedure? Or maybe we can do a TAVI and TAVI and then another TAVI. Um, I think the jury is still out and we are getting better and better as we are collecting more and more insights in the topic. Um, Eberhard already alluded to the durability and the need for revalving. And I think this durability discussion is very important because uh, for years there has been the idea that surgery is the standard and is the bar that Taver has to uh, uh, work against. Uh, well, there, are, there is already some randomized control data with up to five years of one-to-one uh, -one comparison between the two systems. 
And um, I think it's good to briefly compare a self-expanding valve and a balloon expandable valve. And this also elaborates a little bit further on the uh, previous session. If you look at uh, what we know from the balloon expandable valve in the randomized control trials out to five years, obviously most data has been gathered for the Sapien XT that was the randomized controlled partner too. And it turns out that the Sapien XT shows more structural valve degeneration than a surgical valve. But uh, is that a reason for concern? I'm not really concerned. Why? Because the numbers are still low. Look, this is less than 2% at five years. I would not be so worried. And we also um, had this live case uh, uh, earlier today where you could see how um, reproducible uh, basically a revalving procedure can be uh, for a degenerated transcatheter valve. So then in the same um, line of thinking, and if you look at the balloon expandable valves with the S-treat, so the next generation balloon expandable valve, well, the difference between surgery and um, the transcatheter valve is no longer significant. So basically, there is definitely ongoing improvement in the transcatheter valves that we are using today. It's a little bit of a different story with self-expanding valves. Uh, this is uh, data from Surtavi that uh, we presented two years ago, five years follow-up data. If you compare uh, the re-intervention rate, it seems higher or it is higher out to five years with transcatheter valves versus surgery. But we're now looking at the core valve. This is an early generation self-expanding valve. And you see that the differences are uh, specifically there within 30 days. And this typically reflects how we uh, dealt with um, the core valve TAVI back in the day. You know, it was more difficult to, to uh, leave the cat lab with no AR. And sometimes the interpretation of AR was also difficult. And so sometimes you were saying as an operator, well, this will be mild, turned out to be moderate or even more moderate to severe. And then the patient required an additional intervention that was captured in that study. Look what happens uh, if you look uh, after two years, no more difference between the two uh, strategies. And I think that is very important because obviously with second and third gen generation of this core valve platform, Evolute Pro, now Evolute FX, you will not see that early uh, difference between the two procedures. And then if you look at bioprostatic valve dysfunction, all of a sudden, the situation changes because there is more valve dysfunction with surgery as compared to the self-expanding core valve system. And why would that be? Well, predominantly because of non-structural valve degeneration, more patient prosthesis mismatch after surgery, but also over time, there is more structural valve degeneration with, with a surgical valve as compared to a transcatheter self-expanding valve. And this is quite important and different from a balloon expandable system. With a balloon expandable system, you will not see less structural valve degeneration. You will see structural valve degeneration that is on par with surgery. With a self-expanding um, super annular functioning valve, there is less structural valve degeneration. So what to do then with a failing transcatheter heart valve? Um, well, there was an interesting uh, explant TAVA registry done by our good friend Vinny Bapat, where he collected over 200 patients over a decade. And um, he looked at the kind of uh, procedures, the surgical procedures. Well, it turned out that more than 10% of the procedures uh, were not so easy surgeries. They also required root replacement. Obviously, that definitely makes the procedure more difficult, and it turns out that it also translates to more events. Look at the in-hospital stroke rate of 6% and the in-hospital mortality of more than 10%. This is not um, a very easy procedure, and it comes with some penalties that uh, seem to be significant. If you look at this issue of root replacement, when you would explain and a transcatheter valve, then you will see it more often when the valve has been implanted longer time ago. So more recent valves will be easier to, ex to be explanted by a surgeon than valves that have been in situ for longer. So that is one. The other one, the other uh, interesting feature from that analysis from the explant TAVA registry is that um, you will need more root replacements after a 
self-expanding valve than after a balloon expandable valve. And this has to do obviously with the interaction of the frame with the ascending aorta. Turns out that um, also the way a surgeon needs to do an orthotomy uh, when uh, he is doing or when he or she is ex performing an explant, it's more difficult with an evolute valve than as compared with a, uh, with a balloon expandable valve. So you will see more root replacements when explanting a self-expanding uh, self valve than with a balloon expandable valve. Now there is a recent uh, comparison between explants, so surgical explant versus a revalving procedure. This has been published in Jack Cardiovascular Interventions um, and um, the comparison is not a real fair comparison because the patients who underwent uh, explant surgery were different from the patients who went a revalving procedure. Patients with, in the surgical arm were younger, they um, had less calcium, obviously the more calcified the aorta, the higher the likelihood that the patient would be sent for a revalving rather than an explant surgery. And also the patients in the rev uh, revalving group were at higher operative risk. So basically the patients were at higher risk, but at the same time, um, you will see some differences in outcome. The mechanism of valve failure was also interesting. If you compare both treatment arms, you will see more um, structural valve degeneration as a reason for a revalving procedure, where, whether there is more patient prosthesis mismatch as a reason for an explant surgery. And that shouldn't come as a surprise because if there is already severe patient prosthesis mismatch, it will be very difficult to correct that with a transcatheter revalving procedure. Then I feel that an explant of the device and then do a root enlargement makes much more sense from um, <coughs> an execution point of view. Also a difference between in terms of time to re-intervention. If you look at um, surgery, surgery was, um, was being done earlier following the index procedure. So a revalving procedure was more, uh, more often performed later down the stretch. And we already learned that uh, explant surgery will become more complex the longer you wait between the index procedure and the explant procedure. Going back to the explant surgery, again, also in this uh, registry by uh, Gilbert Tang, more than 10% of the explants required root enlargement and root replacement. And also cardiopulmonary bypass time was more than way above two hours. So these are not easy procedures. And then look at the outcomes in terms of mortality. A explant surgery is has a much higher mortality. It's four times higher than a revalving procedure. And this is why I believe that a revalving procedure, so a redo, Transcatheter valve implantation is the preferred strategy for patients with a failing transcatheter valve. But procedural planning is very important, and uh, Professor Park already emphasized the, the importance of CT scanning and uh, meticulous um, interpretation of the CT scans. Well, I'm going to um, show you a case how we are now implementing more advanced simulations um, to uh, plan these revalving procedures. And this is a patient who had a failing surgical valve, but we do the exact same planning now with patients with a failing transcatheter valve. And this patient was a 73-year-old female who had a surgical valve almost 10 years earlier, heavily symptomatic. So she went for, a, for another CT scan to, to do the accurate measurements and see what we, uh, what we can achieve with a revalving procedure. Um, and this is what we do now. We make simulations and reconstructions based on the CT scan. And these reconstructions give us a more spatial and visual interpretation of the anatomy. And it, all, it helps us to interpret the correlation, for instance, with the coronaries. And <laughs> Professor Gruber already mentioned that coronary accessibility is an important aspect of lifetime management. Well, um, this is, well, how you can interpret what would happen if you implant, for instance, an evolute valve. Well, if you implant the evolute valve, well, you will see that you, you will cover the ostium of the left main. So that might not be an, uh, an easy task to uh, prevent this. Well, there is also another way of um, simulating, and this is what FEOPS offers us now. You can simulate the valve implant and again then evaluate how you will um, 
how you will be relative to the coronary ostia. And in this particular case, it becomes clear that um, in terms of um, the left main, you will be in front of the left main. So you will have more than 70% coverage of the left main, whether you go for a deep implant or a superficial, a shallow implant. So this patient is at a high risk for coronary obstruction. So what do we do here? So we decided not to do a basilica, uh, but we, uh, we, um, we preferred the strategy of a chimney technique. So the, this patient underwent an evolute valve, and uh, you can see as we are deploying the valve up to two-thirds of its uh, expansion, uh, we have already a, um, a stand parked in the, in the LAD, and before we completely release the valve, we implant as a chimney a stent in the left main and then as a chimney into the ascending aorta. And this was our final result with good flow in uh, the left main. This is the echo, good results, no significant gradient. And then by CT scan, you see the chimney construction with a patent stent in um, the left main. So to take away, uh, there are no comprehensive data on valve durability comparing TAVI and surgery to date. We only have data out to five years. Obviously, we have the notion data that goes to eight years. And as a matter of fact, at the ESC meeting next week or two weeks from now, they will present the 10 years follow-up data. But notion is a very small underpowered study with a first generation um, a core valve system. So we need 10-year follow-up data from the low-risk trials, the partner three, and the evolute low-risk. Durability cannot be an argument in favor of SAVR in the SAVR versus TAVI discussion. I think that is clear. And the design matters. Not all transcatheter valves are created equal. So a balloon expandable valve may behave differently as compared to a self-expanding valve over time. In terms of lifetime management decisions, I don't think we have an evidence base for this. Uh, but I, uh, but I'm not excluding um, the uh, the strategy of doing three valves, three consecutive valves. So a valve in valve, and then another valve in valve. As long as we have procedural planning to determine whether it's a safe approach, I think that will become feasible. And finally, this is what uh, I also want to endorse: the value of advanced imaging planning. We are still early, but this is going to expand further and will make our procedures safer. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very, thank you very much, uh, Nicolas. Great, great, uh, great presentation. Mm -hmm. And um, now we have uh, the master of the masters, D.W. Park, and he will be talking about something that's very important, confusing at times. That's why the topic, make it simple, Tave anti-thrombotics, evidence-based antiplatelet and anti-thrombotic therapy for TAVA. Okay, thank you, Everhard. So my talking is about uh, make it simple in the TAVA anti-thrombotic. Uh, uh, recently, over the 10 years, uh, uh, important trial was done, and I'm going to uh, briefly summarize. Absolutely, the concern is a dilemma between the leaflet thrombosis and the potent antithrombotic is a, a starting point. Uh, is a, after the type of procedure, we know where leaflet thrombosis is much higher with antiplatelet therapy, could be reduction with antithrombotic therapy, and the initially concern at the time of booming of the type of procedure. But the uh, leaflet thrombosis and the most of the cases subclinical and uh, observed in all type of bioprothetic valve is uh, not associated with the symptom of high transvalvular gradient in most cases. And the NOAA can prevent and resolve, reduce leaflet thrombosis, but still uncertainty about the risk of a stroke or TIN and the valve durability. This is not completely answered yet. So, and the valve thrombosis presented as a diverse spectrum and the most of the case halt with a relative normal leaflet motion and some cases with reduced leaflet motion but normal gradient and some rare case clinical valve thrombosis with elevated gradient. 
Also, we know this is some dynamic pattern in some cases and uh, uh, progress halt and ham and some cases progress uh, regress with from ham to halt and the normal. And uh, absolutely, uh, the, my key uh, the, you know, comment is can see forest for the tree and the leaflet thrombosis is an imaging phenomenon. We should consider the patient itself rather than imaging concern. So, and uh, the reason why, and the usually top of patient and the higher risk of thrombotic and the breathing risk as well, and the uh, stroke and MI and uh, uh, many, many, the new, the new onset AP thrombotic risk much higher. Also, breathing risk is higher in the elderly patient. There's a much vulnerable antithrombotic therapy. And the many clinical trial was done last five year and the published in a lot of important uh, point. And the key targeting is that we try to do find optimal solution is the reason why we in the evaluate the potential NOAC role and the between uh, we try to do make a sweet spot between ischemic event and the uh, breathing event. So if I'm gonna summarize overall thrombotic and breathing risk in the prior RCT, and the major stroke, like uh, uh, the ischemic event, is uh, usually less than 10%. And by contrast, the major or life-threatening breathing was uh, uh, less than 30%. We should balance and uh, uh, less potent, always winner in the concept of the clinical trial, the reason why many trials was done uh, with this concept. So, and the uh, full uh, consecutive slide is uh, uh, accumulatively the summarized all available data, and this is uh, uh, targeting for patient without OAC indication, depth versus single antiplatelet therapy, and the RT trial, popular TABI trial, compared aspirin versus aspirin plus clopidogrel consistently breathing was much higher with the dual antiplatelet therapy, and the MACE was no difference at all. In the ARTE trial, this is a net clinical, the benefit outcome, and the reason why the MACE also much higher. So, and uh, some important trial evaluated the OAC role in patient without the uh, OAC indication, and the Galileo trial, Atlantis uh, stratum 2, and uh, most uh, importantly, Breathing was consistently higher with uh, a no arc is rivaroxaban and affixaban. Also, all cause mortality, cardiovascular mortality, non cardiovascular mortality was higher in Galileo trial. Uh, the, in Atlantis trial, all cause deaths are much higher, non cardiovascular was higher. There is no further benefit with the use of OAC in patients without OAC indication. It's an interesting thing. In this finding consistent Galileo 4D trial, Atlantis 4D trial, if you're gonna use a much potent OAC compared to antiplatelet, you can reduce the overall instance of leaflet thrombosis. So this is not directly translated to the patient benefit. The reason why I can see forest for the tree, leaflet thrombosis imaging phenomenon, we should consider the patient itself rather than imaging concern. The another trial was evaluated in patient with OAC indication, OAC versus OAC plus a single antiplatelet therapy, popular tabi called B trial, you know, the OAC plus clopidogrel associates a much higher risk of the bleeding without no significant difference of the mace. And also this is uh, evaluated Atlantis stratum one trial, is uh, the NICO was a key PI of Ambisage Tabi trial. This both trial shows the neutral event of the overall outcome in Ambisage Taba trial, breathing event much higher with the adoxaban compared to the warfarin. So, and why several RCT for Tabor patient failed 
And the, the reason why ischemic bleeding leverage is much, much complex in elderly TABA patients. In our concept, you know, well-balanced bleeding and the ischemic risk was applicable relatively younger HS or PCI population. However, in TABA population, usually elderly and fragile and mortality, ischemic event, bleeding event, and the uh, the balance matching is very, very difficult and they usually use the, the crossing effect in the, the hazard. So key question regarding Holt and Lamb, and this is a re the read to clinical event or cause structural valve degeneration. And the, the reason why we don't know still, and the causal relationship of leaflet thrombosis with the cerebral thromboembolism, this is uh, done in our ADAPT TABA trial. It's presented the ACC rate breaking trial, published the circulation last year. Our trial evaluated 220 patients without OAC indication, DAPT versus Edoxaban, and we evaluated the CT and the cardiac MRI, and the most of the cases, more than 95%, we done six months cardiac CT, brain MRI done more than five, uh, five nine percent, and the uh, uh, neurologic assessment was done, it's more than 95%, and the key finding of there is no association of a severity of a heart with the extent of a new region on serial brain MRI, also, no association of the severity of a halt with the decline of a neurological assessment. So, and the, all data was adapted as a, a recent guideline and the European guideline and the US guideline is OAC recommendation in TAVI patient with OAC indication like atrial fibrillation. Without OAC, indica OAC indication, just the single antiplatelet therapy was recommended, and the routine use uh, NOAC is not recommended in patients TAVI without OAC indication. It's class three recommendation. This is absolutely consistent in the US guideline. So, and uh, given no association of HOLT and the cerebral thromboembolism, our adept TABA trial also strongly support current valve guideline without OS indication. Is a, the answer is a simpler, is a better. So, and the summary, the anti therapy after TAVA, and even though there are many, many controversial data, it's a too much complex data, we can make it simpler. Current available random trial shows no benefit of a DOAP with a considerable hazard in patients without OAS indication, and the neutral effect in patient was with OAS indication. The leaflet thrombosis has not been proven to directly affect thromboembolic event at the tower, and the such evidence do not support imaging-guided antithrombotic strategy in cases without hemodynamic or clinical significance. TAVA patient is absolutely different compared to ACS or PCI patient. Less is a more concept of anti thrombotic therapy would be optimal management for TAVA procedure. This is uh, absolutely adapted in current guideline. Final one single message, make it simple. Anti-thrombotic therapy after TAVA treat patient not the valve approach. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, <clears throat> Dagu. And uh, we have 20 minutes for discussion. And I, I'm a moderator. I just came in, so I have a privilege. <laughs> I want to have the first question. And I, I play devil's advocate. Uh, I hope you don't misunderstand. But I, I don't exactly know what you mean, let's treat the valve. Uh, let's treat the patient, not the valve, which is basically the same. Are we looking at imaging or clinical events? Uh, I, in, in, in terms of complications, I think it is a little bit different when we look at, um, at thrombosis. If you have an artificial heart valve, I would be, I, 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 it would be interesting to see anyone sitting here uh, having a tower valve, or any valve, artificial heart valve, and he has a thrombosis. Uh, would he still have the same opinion, well, I don't really care whether I have a, have a thrombosis, or does he care? Let's not forget the first heart patients had strokes. 
And, you know, do we know when you have some, uh, when you have some image of uh, thrombus, can you guarantee that, that nothing happens? The fundamental thing is there are statistics and there are clinical events. And I'm not sure whether the statistics can give us an answer to all of this. Um, so would you, when would you do a CT for further imaging after an artificial heart valve? What is the indication? So uh, I think current uh, updated guidelines do not recommend a routine CT scanning. And I think we're going to do advanced imaging modality using the 4D dimensional CT scanning. There is some higher possibility of detection of the heart. But then uh, our usual practice, and we do sometimes the six months and the one or two year uh, routine echocardiographic follow-up to assess the valve durability and the valve you know, function. If pressure gradient is going up, at the time, we check it up the CT scan, and there is some uh, halt or ham, we change the antithrombotic is a NOAC. But uh, without no symptom, no pressure gradient going up, we don't do the CT scan. We just do routine echocardiographic follow. That is our the routine practice. Yeah, I, th I mean, I think the problem, I mean, I agree with what DW said about treat the patient, not the, not the image, not the valve. And because the problem is, I mean, you're right that, that HALT is not benign. But the problem is our treatments are even less benign. Um, and so that's the challenge we have is that every time we have tried to prophylactically prevent HALT, um, it hurts people. Um, and so that's the, that, that's the challenge we have. Now, are there, I mean, maybe some of the very new anticoagulants, the factor 11 inhibitors or things like that that are coming down the pike might change things? Or maybe we need, you know, now that we're in a very different era of treating lower risk patients, we need to do a trial in low risk patients who are, you know, much less low, you know, risk, risk for bleeding. But it seems very clear that in the intermediate and high risk patients right now are, you know, preventing the disease is more harmful than waiting for it to develop and then treating it. That's, that's, that's what the, the message seems to be. I mean, certainly most patients coming through now, it's more complex. So a lot of them have GI bleed. You actually then work up at AS and therefore <laughs> it's very hard to give them anything, you know, even aspirin. Yeah. I mean, it's, it always made se it made sense we should prevent it, but then when we tried, it didn't. You know, it, it, uh, the data were pretty clear; it was not helping. Um, well, the surgeons, if you recall, they started their patients for three months in, bio, in, the, in the early bioprosthetic area. They started to put patients on, on low warfarin to prevent uh, to you know to <clears throat> encourage the early healing with a chance to have less thrombosis. Whether that's true or not remains to be seen, but I think, uh, not that I, you know, I understand less is more here, and I, I follow the guidelines. I, I just had, I, I just don't have a pro I, I have a problem saying, you know, and then you corrected it. It's not, it's not benign to have a thrombosis. And I, to be honest, if I have an artificial valve, well, <clears throat> I would like to know whether I have a thrombosis <laughs> or not. So you want a CT, the follow-up. Right. Yeah. I mean, Maybe the nice thing about surgery is that they can do whatever they want without any test of any. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> let's do three months. Let's not do three months. Really, it has never mm -hmm. proven that three months doing what. Yeah. yeah. Right. So, but while we always look for evidence, which kind of make us a bit yeah. more, you know, our thinking more burdensome. And I think also that I mean, the surgical patients, even the historical data that led to the recommendation of three months of anticoagulation for mm -hmm. surgical patients, I mean, surgery patients were lower risk always than the TAVR patients, right? So that, I mean, it may be that, you know, there is a subgroup of TAVR patients who we should anticoagulate, but we don't, we haven't found it yet. That's, you know. SJ, you wanted to say something? Exactly, uh, you know, the same with the TW. Something is uh, after the routine follow-up of echocardiogram, there are some hemodynamic changes. Uh, you're gonna do the CT. They are imaging. However, in most cases, not for whole cases, actually after uh, anticoagulation treatment, getting better. And what I think is the main mechanism may be, you know, some thrombotic uh, phenomenon is, however, the degree, uh, you know, leads to the hemodynamic, uh, you know, uh, disturbance, then maybe, 
influence the clinical outcome. Uh, at that time, uh, I would like to start to treat them. So that is my yeah. Um, yes, and, and <coughs> I have a comment about the halt and then uh, the structural valvular damage so after tablet because uh, it's not uh, the uh, problem of the anti-thrombotic strategy. It's a uh, uh, problem associated with the atherosclerotic change itself mm -hmm. because the uh, valve is a uh, uh, tissue valve. So tissue valve is uh, very um, um, associated with the atherosclerotic change as like uh, aorta. So I think uh, it's, uh, we have to concern about the patient uh, blood pressure and cholesterol level after tablet procedure. Yeah, um, I would like to, yeah. Question? Uh, uh, may I uh, make a comment? Uh, I think the, the baseline, uh, uh, guideline, based on uh, such kind of clinical trials uh, quoted by Dr. Uh, uh, Doug Park uh, has some uh, faults because uh, in, when they compared the monotherapy versus uh, DAPT, the duration follow is just six months or 12 months, and they focus on trivial bleeding, nascent bleeding, not a major event or a valve durability or valve degeneration. That takes about five or 10 years. But guidelines just based on those uh, unreasonable results just recommend single antiplate agent. When compared the APT versus one uh, antiplate agent plus oral anticoagulant, there's also high bleeding in one year follow. So that is not our uh, purpose to assess antithrombotherapy in terms of TAVA. Because the main uh, uh, kind of cumulative event rate of uh, TAVA is totally different from the PCI. PCI is uh, just uh, focused on the acute phase just within a year, then we can assess the antiplate therapy beyond one year, always stable, but toddlers continuous problem occurs. Then we have to determine the adequate duration of efficacy of certain mm -hmm. antithrombotherapy at least five years. In terms of detection of uh, valve function by echo, it's really insensitive. I have a numerous case of normal valve function, perfect function with significant Halt. I believe halt is not risk factor for thrombosis, but it is a risk factor of valve degeneration, shortened longevity of valve. Thus, I always checked a serial CT if patient kidney permits, and I always adjust uh, my own antithrombotherapy. If there is halt, I always add low dose NOAC or low dose warfarin to check the progression of halt. Mostly it does not regress. Sometimes it progress, but with the addition of antithrombotic therapy, we can make it stable. That's my own uh, practice. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> before, can we get away a little bit from halt? And I don't, we don't have much time, durability. Um, uh, Professor van Miegem, you are a balanced, uh, a balanced user of various valves. And w w what I'm, I'm always a little bit concerned, a any study that's being done, there's criticism. I, I don't think there's any study until today that uh, couldn't be criticized. Now, you know, if, if you look at the, at the, self, at the balloon expandable XT, versus uh, S3 and surgery, versus the self-expanding ones that were available and have almost the same time, uh, time, time course, five years and, and beyond. Do you think, what is the reason that the number, that XT and S3 behave differently in relation to surgery, even though the design didn't change much, height didn't change much, uh, uh, the, the leaflets didn't change much, anti-calcification, uh, you know, the, 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 the cells were, but the fundamental design remained the same, uh, as opposed to the self-expanding valves where, where, you know, you had 
changes, but the fundamental difference between the two is obvious, of course, to you. Do you see their difference, or is this artificial, or just do we need more data? Well, well, it's always difficult to extrapolate and then start comparing devices over different trials, right? And uh, I agree with, with your early comment during your presentation that um, the Sapien XT data was then a little bit polluted with the S3 data, right? Because all of a sudden a randomized study cord was compared with a registry cord. So that always, um, you need to be cautious there. Uh, at the same time, I respectfully disagree with you. I think that the S3 is a totally different animal than the XT. I mean, the, the stand frame is significantly higher. And all of a sudden, there is the introduction of an, an, uh, a ceiling fabric on the outside. That changes the paradigm, I think. So I, I think structural valve degeneration is not only a difference in um, in gradients, it's also an issue of, of uh, aortic regurgitation. Uh, granted, paravalvular leak uh, is, um, is a non-structural valve degeneration, but um, I, I, I can accept and I understand that an S3 might be the better valve over the XT in terms of durability. I, I, have, no, I have no reason to be concerned about that. Um, but obviously, we are extrapolating, and we will never do a head-to-head -head comparison of an XT with an S3. And for the time being, also the head-to-head -head comparisons of uh, an Evolute valve with an S3 is yep. also not there. So it's, it's, also, it's always going to be speculation here. I have a question for Eberhardt and for Nicole. Is that you know, this lifetime management issue? So if we in the US at 65, we can do a TAVR, right? So let's say you decided to do a TAVR. Of course, there's a reason that 65 you can go with surgery. That's separate. Let's say you decided the person should get a TAVR. I'm not quite sure why we don't plan ahead for the next two valves. Why? It's always kind of confusing to me that sometimes you get older, you should go for surgery. It, it seems odd, right, because you are at higher risk. And the demand for the valve is also a little less when you get older because you're not moving as much. So the, if the EOA is a little smaller, and also, the coronary doesn't change. So are there coronary disease at 65? Are there at 75? The likelihood is suddenly got left main. So I want to think about what should we be thinking about having three valves in already at 65? Once you decided to put the first one in as a, as a tablet, mm -hmm. is there a reason not to do that um, from planning ahead? Even though, obviously, we don't want to plan for 20 years of treatment, but why not to look ahead a little bit? Is that is like there? their biography that you want to kind of establish at that time? Well, I think, I think we should do that. Yeah. I really think we should look ahead in time because this patient, let's face it, we're not curing our patients, right? Our patients will, they remain yeah. heart patients for the, for the remainder of their lives. And that is okay. We can, we can handle that. We can deal with that. But I feel that, you know, we are, we are obliged to, um, to, really understand the anatomy that we are facing before we implant the valve. Are we, so, you know, it's very different if there is a deficient sinus versus as a, a well-developed sinus. So when there is a risk of sequestration, we really need to be upfront aware of what is the height of the coronaries, because that changes everything. Uh, Eberhard already alluded to the Jena valve. Well, if you have a low coronary implant, a Jena valve might be your, your first go-to valve, even for aortic stenosis. And then, you know, you have to be uh, able to do this commissural alignment for all your valves. And even for a sapien valve that becomes over that, you know, with the sapien, with the next generation balloon expandable valve, there is also this feature where you can also do a commissural alignment with, with the balloon expandable valve. And I think that is the way to go. And I'm not so convinced that we will be explanting a lot of transcatheter valves in the future. I think we will do valve and valve and then maybe another valve. Can I, can I just, I mean, I want to add into that because I mean, I think this is what we need to be discussing, for sure. Um, I, I think there, there are two, the, the challenge is there's always a balance. And one of the balancing factors is, you know, if we're thinking 20 years ahead, which is what you're advocating, and I think we need to at some level, we have no idea what technologies are gonna exist in 20 years. So that always is a risk of planning for something that may not happen. That's one of the challenges. On the other side, I mean, I think if we do a TAVR in a 65-year-old, Based on what we know today, we, we need to have a plan for the third valve. It can't be an explant. 
it ha we have to have a plan. And so if we don't have a plan for the third valve in a 65-year-old, we shouldn't be doing a TABR in a 65-year-old. Mm -hmm. I mean, I agree that, that, that you know, the technology coming up, but hopefully the technology is better than what we have. No, I, right? I mean, something so, to take out the leaflets, right, something right. to, you know, but, right. but so we it should be tabber forever. It should not be sort of thinking about this complicated stuff, explain this now, explain that now. It's just that once you put in a 65 year old. But you don't want to be that staring at a, an 85 year old in 20 years saying you need to have surgery now. And they're like, well, I could have had it when I was 65. And, you know, and so I think that is the challenge is, um, that balance is not so easy and it's, you know, but I don't, I don't think, I think we really need to make sure we have a way to get people through three valves if we're going to be putting them in young people. That's, if we can't do it. So, so our left side, it, you know, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a little, yeah, it's a little quiet. And Taro, uh, you know, and wake up and now <laughs> we are asking you, um, the, the specifics about Japan is, there are small people, small, small areas, small, small valves. Um, and, uh, you know, there the, the valve and valve and valve situation is particularly important. Um, are you thinking about this, discussing it, or are you just ignoring it? So actually, the, uh, it's quite important to check the repeatability of the procedure, especially for the patient with a small sinus of a salva. So otherwise, it's quite difficult to do that. And uh, sometimes we put the uh, serpent tree 20 millimeter in native aerotic valve or it's, uh, air fluid 23 in native aerotic valve. However, we put the uh, third valve inside of the uh, serpent tree 20. The, the size of the valve will be quite small. So I'm not quite sure that will be doable, but uh, we will see. And we also need to respect the uh, sinus of a uh, saba, the repeatability of the procedure. Okay. Well, I think that was an interesting discussion, excellent presentation. Thank you all for being actively involved. And uh, I think we adjourn. And uh, I think it's exactly. next is on, right? <laughs> next. Okay. Next one,